Senator Brown, um, David Vitter, Senator Vitter is so politically opposite of you on so many issues. How did this thing come about, this this coalition or this 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 piece of legislation? Well, I was sitting in banking committee one day, and he sits, we sit in a semicircle, and the Republicans sit across from the Democrats, and I listen to him question uh, Secretary Geithner about um, capital standards and realized he was pretty aggressive, and he was willing to say some things that I thought were were um, a bit of a challenge to Wall Street, to the large five, six, seven banks in Wall Street. And um, I just walked over and started talking to him. I said, I think we can work together in some of this. And I, I think that the, the skepticism that, that many progressives have about, about big banks and Wall Street um, is not too different from the skepticism people on the right have about government. And I think in this case, there, there's some overlap there that the regulators and Wall Street and the influence Wall Street has with the regulators, all of that combined does in fact put our economy, our whole financial system, puts Main Street at risk. And that's why I've been able to team up on this legislation. Can you summarize this legislation? Yeah, it does, does a, a number of things, but primarily uh, it sets capital standards high enough, meaning banks have to hold equity um, in, in, uh, of their, of, among, as a, as a 15% of their assets. And that means if the bank has a seven or 8% drop in value because of some market forces or some mistakes they make, they still are protected against going under, against being unsustainable as a financial institution. And that's significantly higher than we've seen in the past. The second thing is there, we've, we've since Roosevelt built a safety net for banks, um, FDIC, the Federal Reserve, so that um, if there's a run on the bank that the depositors are protected. Um, that safety net shouldn't extend to the Wall Street traders, um, that's traders with a D, and should not not extend to derivatives and, and uh, credit default swaps. It should only be on traditional, what we used to call boring banking. That's where the, so it, it takes away that, that safety net by and large for those non-bank activities. And that means directly that these banks will not be engaged in the kind of risk they have been because they're no longer getting this implicit subsidies that big banks get um, because the market believes these banks are in fact too big to fail. Is that, does that mean that it is uh, actually one step toward restoring Glass-Steagall or undoing Graham Leach Bliley? Um, it's one, it, it's, I, I'm not saying, I, prescriptively it's not exactly Glass, but it's not Glass-Steagall, but it does, it does say to these banks, you're not getting guarantees if you if you go outside regular banking. Right, so the commercial side is protected. Correct. The, the, the gambling side, yes. side is not. Yes, correct. Now, I understand that that right now, big big uh, national banks have an advantage with regard to regulation and backstopping by the by the government that credit unions, small community banks, rural banks don't have, and that this bill seeks to fix that. Do I understand correct. that if correctly? You're, if you're an investor. You lend money to one of the Wall Street banks, you will lend to them, evidence shows, you'll lend them money at a rate of 50 basis points, a half a percent, three quarters, maybe a full percent lower interest rates than you would lend to a community bank in Sycamore, Ohio, or Coldwater, Ohio, or to one of the big regionals in Columbus like Huntington. Um, because the market understands that these large banks are too big to fail. So there is there is virtually no risk in your lending money to a Wall Street bank because they because implicit in that is there is no risk, so you'll lend them money um, at lower cost. So they, they automatically, including according to Bloomberg, these largest six banks get about an $80 billion a year subsidy um, from taxpayers, from the government, implicitly in the form of lower interest rates on the capital markets. Just because as people assume that there's, or because the because the markets are assuming that there's less risk there, this is the moral hazard in reverse, isn't it? Yeah, it's a moral hazard. That's a good way to say it. The market assumes there's virtually no risk because the government will bail them out. And, and look at what's happened to these banks. Twenty years ago, the six largest Wall Street banks, six largest banks in this country, had a um, their their combined assets were about 16, 17, 18 percent of GDP. Today, their combined assets are approaching 65 percent of GDP. So through because they get these subsidies, 
because of mergers and because of banks imploding and all that happened in 2007, 8, 9, 10, and since, uh, you are seeing the big banks get larger and larger. The four biggest banks have increased their size by $2 trillion. Uh, the largest bank's assets are now um, Bank of America and J.P. Morgan Chase are more than $2 trillion in assets. Uh, and, you know, they, it's not a question of economies of scale and efficiencies. Um, you can be efficient at a two or three or four hundred billion dollar bank just just as efficient. Um, the size of these banks, it's it's the economic power they have when they're that big. And it's the political power. And you can see that in their reaction to the implementation of Dodd-Frank uh, and what's happened with the Volcker rule and other rules that have not been finalized because of Wall Street lobbying. Thomas Jefferson used the phrase, if if overgrown wealth become a, were to become a risk to the state, and then he called for essentially an inheritance tax. But, you know, that, that concept that excessive wealth can be a threat to the state, a threat to legislation, if these banks control over 60 percent of GDP or assets equal to over 60 percent of GDP, do you really think that you can get this through the Senate, that you and, and um, Senator Vitter? I think, I, I don't know. A year ago, I would have said no. Um, when Senator Kaufman and I introduced the legislation to break up the largest five, six banks back in 2010, we got 33, 34 votes, including two, including three Republicans. Um, we're now working with 10 Republican offices. A number of Democrats who voted no on our amendment have said now they're going to vote yes. They've, they've changed. And, and I think people have seen, the people in the Senate have seen the size of these banks and, and the economic and political power they have. It's not to say it's going to be easy. I think we have a shot at doing it. I've seen the, the public has changed. You see people like George Will and um, Thomas Honig uh, as, a, as a, a bank administrator, as, an F, as a, um, a Federal Reserve administrator, and now at FDIC, you see a number of conservative regulators and columnists who now say these banks are too big to fail. This is a problem. We need either to we need to take away some of their guarantees and protections. They can either build more equity in their banks, or they can begin to divest some of the some of their holdings in these big banks. It's their and, choice. And for our listeners or viewers who might want to. Uh, reach out and support the work that you're doing, how, that you and Senator David Vitter are doing, actually, how do they do that? Well, a number of ways. They can um, certainly to write and call and email their, their senators. Uh, come on my website, SheridBrown.com. You can, you can help us with petitioning we're doing and other things. Um, this, is a, this is a sort of old Hubert Humphrey inside-outside strategy. I'm working my colleagues and working with outside groups and individuals online makes it a whole lot easier to put pressure on senators and congressmen to, to pay attention to this, that this issue isn't going away, that Wall Street money doesn't necessarily have to carry the day, and that citizen, vol citizen involvement really can matter in this issue. Senator Brown, thank my you so pleasure. much. Thanks, Tom. Keep up the great thank work. You. Thanks. Thank you.